Hey, everybody. Welcome back to PD and P-Dubs Unscripted. It is wonderful to be with you again today. And uh, PD, great to have you with us as well. Yeah, it's good to be here back on the podcast, down in the studio. It's like we never left here. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, we just go from week to week and it's like we never leave the room. Right. <laughs> well, maybe we haven't left Maybe the room. we should let them in on the clue. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we're well, trying well, to... Do a little double recording here today since I got to be in West Virginia the following week after recording. So to not deprive our awesome listeners of an episode, we figured we would power through a recording of two. Yeah, we just didn't want you to think like we're we're showing up with the same clothes on, you know, you know, you know, two weeks in a row. You start wondering about us. Not that you could see any of that. And I wanted to kind of joke around almost where like I was thinking. I'm like, oh, yeah, I could have you ask me how the mission trip was. And I can be like some of our students who went eighth graders when they were saying their favorite memory of Emmanuel was West Virginia. And they hadn't gone on the trip yet. (laughs) And they were just anticipating that it's going to be great. That's a lot of expectation. Oh, man, that's putting a lot of pressure on that trip. I got to, man, I got to step on my A game, I wonder. I think you do. I'm not the one leading it, so I don't know. Do I need to stop? Well, you know, you got to show them the way. You're the pastor. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, you know, we got some fun, some, you know, like I said, I was just telling you about how, you know, I'm going to bring this game that uh, Sophie in our office talked about called Throw Throw Burrito. Mm-hmm. Maybe our audience knows a Throw Throw Burrito where you throw this little foam stuffed burrito at people. <laughs> I've never heard of it, but it looks Look, kind of fun. Looks crazy. Looks crazy nuts. And then, you know, it's the classic game Pit. That's just a chaotic, mm-hmm. a lot of yelling. Mm-hmm. Good old bus ride games, you know, down to West Virginia. Yeah, I still give the one year, I think it was the second year I was at Emanuel, so the second mission trip and when we went to Wheelwright, Kentucky, I'll give that group, those boys, they were pretty smart on the bus because the bus driver told us how we could put some of the back rows to face each other and put a table down in between mm, them. Yeah. And they played Monopoly, but they were smart enough to bring tape to tape down the houses and the hotel. Oh, hey there. So they were thinking a little bit. That's good. That's a good forethought. That's a good forethought. I'll give them credit on that one. You know, I'm still a little bitter about that Monopoly game because I think I didn't pass, like, I think I went like four times around Go Mm -hmm. without ever landing on anything to purchase. Oh, wow. That's just a quick exit out when you go four times around and you aren't able to buy anything. That's... That's really weird. How how did you accomplish that? I think it was either like chance or oh okay or some of the community chest community chest or land, pay the tax pay the tax or like landing on something that somebody already ahead of me purchased yeah or landing just on go or the just waiting yeah so yeah that was Ooh, that's not rough. a not a fun monopoly game no no but actually I like the board game life life is fun yeah um. You know, you got you got your car with your family. You're loading up the the kiddos, the pinks mm-hmm. and the blues. And you got to determine: Do you want to go to college first and have those loans, or just start your career and not get as high paying of a career? Right, right. There's there's all the pathways that you go to, and that whole spinny dial. You know. Oh, I can just hear that in yeah, my head. Exactly. It had a distinct. <laughs> you know that was pretty cool. And uh, you know they even had some like mountainous areas in the, the on the trail, and you could take the rocky path if you want. Uh huh. Haven't played the game of life in a long time. I played it because I have it on my iPad. Like I think I bought it once, mm. for, like a couple bucks. I was like, let's play the game of life on the iPad. <sighs> How not... was that? Uh, you, know, <laughs> okay. you know, it's not bad, but it's yeah. still not the same. Because yeah. I mean, instead of going the spin. You got to just go boom and like, I mean, keep track because like, I don't know about you, but when I played life, I never kept track of those little life tiles. No, I didn't either. So, I mean, they do that for you in that game. Okay. Well, that helps. So that's good. You know, I'm going to have to go into our game closet because I'm pretty sure we have the game of life at our house. Maybe tonight I'm going to play some life. Okay. I mean, I would say also I'm an Oregon Trail person. That was a great game for the computer. Oh, I never had that. Never played that. Oh, that that was fun. Going Hmm. out hunting, and then they'd be like, you killed 500 pounds worth of food, but you can only get carry 200 pounds of food back with you. (laughs) And you're making the Oregon Trail out west, and then it'd be at one point like, Pastor Warren got bitten by a snake. 
Leave him, leave him behind or try to help heal him. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Don't worry about me. And then Keep if, going. And then if you die, it's like here, they put like a little tombstone up that says where you died. <laughs> Tell everyone I'll, I'll miss them. Keep then going. It's, then it's like, do you want to ford across the river? This is how deep it is. Mm. Or do you want to pay the money and take a ferry across? If you ford it, then it crashes and then you might lose some oxen or axles off your wagon. Oh, boy. Oh, Oregon Trail. That's a tough existence. Well, that's what it was Ooh. in the 1800s. Wow. I mean, boy, that's getting you right down on that dusty trail. Right? Oh, yeah. ooh yeah. Well, you know, we're not here to talk about the Oregon Trail, but we are you know, kind of talking about life with the Lord. And uh, the next uh, big day uh, in this Easter season starts a new season called the Season of Pentecost. There's, there's a lot of weeks of Pentecost. Absolutely, and Pentecost is uh, 50 days after the resurrection, and uh, interestingly enough, Pentecost has also been called in the in the church Whit Sunday, W-H-I-T, Whit Sunday. I think you're uh, making that up. Or you put the two together, not just two words, but one word, Whit Sunday, or just take the day out and call it Whit Sun. That's an interesting. Wilson? Not Wilson. <laughs> Whitson. Whit. Whit. I feel like I have to emphasize the WH on the wh- Whit. Whit. But it looks like Whitson is more commonly among Angelicans and Methodists. Mm, there you go. Uh, I've always just called it Pentecost. Me too. Now, interestingly enough, as we were kind of looking at this, uh, last week we talked about the ascension, uh, you know, commemorating the ascent of Jesus into heaven. Here um, in our article, it says that Pentecost um, commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and the followers of Christ. So it's kind of like, uh, just as Jesus said, he said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. So here he comes. Right. And if you, you know, that's what we talked about last week on the podcast. If you haven't listened to that, stop this one. Yeah. And go back and listen to last week's and rate it with five stars, <laughs> you know, and share it out. Get more listeners here. Exactly. So um, why don't we go into God's Word and just uh, read a little bit of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. And uh, Pastor's going to just delight in me reading about all the various regions oh, yes. uh, where people um, went out to. So, do you, Did you study your Blue Letter Bible today? Uh, no, but yeah, we should, uh, we should call that up in a little bit. Uh, okay. So you can get that ready while I'm reading. And uh, maybe we could hear some uh, Strong's G2562. Oh, nothing beats a Strong's. Parthians. Parthians. <laughs> <laughs> People are probably like, "What is he talking about? Whose oh. voice is he is he imitating?" Oh, it's oh, you it, wait. It is. I think we have had this voice on here. Yeah, we have. I forgot. Was it split some? Uh, the like the deep inwards split splice. Spl- spl- <laughs> I can't think of the word. My Greek, my Greek is failing me here. It's splizomai. It's splagizomai. Uh, uh, splagizomai. I think that's the one we had the big uh, strong. Yeah, yeah. The blue letter. And Bible. so, like, I I have listened to that so much. I feel like I have a pretty good impersonation of that. Strong G. <laughs> All right. So I'll wait. Uh, do you want me to just go right into the reading? Oh yes. Okay. All right. All right, I have to get serious now. I'm reading from uh, the book of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because one was hearing them speak in his own language, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? 
Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. And uh, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own languages the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? They're good Lutherans. Uh, but, yes. but others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. And uh, that's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I do have Strong's G right. <laughs> okay, so hold on. What's the what's the G, the Strong's G number? Uh, for this first one, sorry, I'm, I got my mic pointed down to my computer to pick it up better. Fifty four thirty five. Fifty four thirty five, and the word is uh, fissury. <laughs> Phrygia. Phrygia. Okay. Right. What did you say? Fifty five forty five. Thirty five. Fifty five thirty five. All right. So here's my imitation. Strong's G fifty five thirty five. Phrygia. Phrygia. All right, now. Strong's G, 5435. Phrygia. 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 Should we try Pamphylia? Yes, please. Do you want the number for that? Yes. 3828. 3828 for Pamphylia. Strong's G. I forgot the word, or I forgot the number, 2578. (laughs) Pamphylia. Pamphylia. Strong's G, 3828, Pamphylia. Oh, Pamphylia. man. We are messing up. I know. How did I pass Greek? I don't know. <laughs> Pamphylia. One more. Yes. Strong's G, 4339, Praselutas. Praselutas. Proselytes. Oh, my. But, yeah, so this is the fun that we have <laughs> here as pastors is... <laughs> I don't know if it's making fun of the blue letter Bible well, guy. I think we're making fun of us because we are just like bad at saying our Greek. Bad at our Greek pronunciation. But it's just funny. Like I'm like, do they just like copy the G and just like, okay, we're gonna add a new number. Yeah. You don't have to say G every time. Well, like we were talking the other day, this this poor guy who has to say so many strong G's references, he he kind of sounds angry after a while. Strong's G, <laughs> fifty four thirty five. I've done 5,435 of these citations. Why? <laughs> but yes, nothing beats a good Strong's uh, concordance there. That's right. But so, yeah, so back to the text here and not mm-hmm. just goofing off here with yeah. the blue letter Bible. But right. that's maybe what we need. Could may, oh, man, that'll take a lot of time and effort. But what if I like just do a whole reading where I just like... <laughs> Keep hitting the Strong's G <laughs> on the hard words? Yeah. <laughs> or what I gotta like, or just like record it all in advance, yeah, where you just yeah. have to play, and that's all you hear. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would be funny. Be very ro- wooden and robotic. Yeah. So, like, let's get right to it on the day of the Pentecost. Now, that was a festival that was uh, celebrated in the Old Testament time. It was uh, the Jewish festival of Shabbat, uh, celebrated on the fiftieth day after Passover. And it's also known as the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of 50 Days in rabbinic tradition. So this isn't just um, a fest, something that happened now for the first time. This is why everybody from all these regions came to Jerusalem because of this festival. So God used something that he ordained in the Old Testament to bring his people together to celebrate um, the goodness of the Lord. And so that's why there's so many people from different regions. So he, he literally is bringing the world together. And, um, and that's where it says, all were gathered in one place. And then the sound, like suddenly there came from heaven a sound. It wasn't a wind. It sounded like a mighty rushing wind, which yeah. is interesting. Like, like I picture, I don't know, and this is not really a wind sound, but I almost picture like, the sound that I heard multiple times yesterday, but a freight train. Mm. Just that sound of like the train going by because it feels like a rushing wind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Out by my house, they are, I think they're probably like um, sandblasting the water tower, which is not far. I can see the water tower out of my bedroom. And I had the window open and they've got the water tower draped with stuff. 
And uh, I just kept hearing this. <sighs> I'm like, what is going on out there? It sounded like a mighty rushing wind. Well, it was them underneath the cover of this water tower, mm. and they were sandblasting. I'm like, so I didn't feel a wind, but I heard something that sounded like a mighty wind. So I, I kind of get that. And uh, so, and this sound filled the entire house where they were sitting. And now here's something utterly crazy. And divided tongues, as of fire, appeared to them and rested on each of them. So that resting on each of them, what does that mean, Pastor? Like, what? Yeah, I always just picture like, you know, the Sunday school drawing of like flames just floating above the people's heads, which seems just crazy, like. We've never, who's ever seen something like that? Mm -hmm. And it's like, what is, you gotta be wondering what's going on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like, I think of the fire, I think of like the consuming fire, like the burning bush, you know, like it, it didn't consume the bush, but it burned, it was burning the bush, the burst, right. bush was burning, but it didn't like consume it and make it into ash. Here we've got tongues of fire, things that look like little tongues of fire, and it's uh, and it came and rested on each of them. I think that phrase "rested on each of them" might be like how when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and the Holy Spirit came upon him and rested on him or lighted on him. I think Luke says um, in the form of a dove. So this could be an action denoting an anointing. What do you think of that? Yeah, I'm just looking up here. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, I'm just looking at the LSB, Lutheran Study Bible. It says, Tongues of Fire, Luke describes a scene with a comparison. The emphasis in the wording is on the mouth, tongue, speak, utterance, which may indicate where the fire appeared. See Moses' appearance in Exodus 34, 29. The fire appropriately appears as tongues of flame, since the Holy Spirit works through the apostles' speech. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, angelic spirits were described as fire, Check out Psalm 104, verses 3 through 4. Fire also represented the presence of God's Spirit, Exodus 32, 4. Hmm. Yeah, so that makes sense because the tongues of fire are now going to do something to their tongues, the ability to talk in different languages that they never knew of or, you know, were even schooled in. And, like, you just wonder, like, did they, like, speak, like, their own, what they would say, like, in their, like, you know, as I'm saying these words, I know what I'm saying. Yeah. But as it came out of their mouth. Maybe, I, and if I was, like, uh, let's say Sp Spanish, speaking. it would come out in Spanish to Or me. you just hear it that way. I hear it that way. Well, and here here it is. And and I think you're onto something. Um. That says in verse 6, And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So it's, maybe that was it. Like, so it's not like they not were like speaking. like they were speaking the language, but maybe that's how they were hearing. So like God was bringing people of various languages together, and while they were speaking, they could hear each other and understand. God was using Google Translate. Ah, aha. Well, this is kind of the opposite of what happened in the Tower of Babel, you know, where, you know, God confused all of right, their they speech. they were using speech for the negative to make themselves God. Yeah. But here they're proclaiming who God is. Mm -hmm. And so it opened up their ears to understand. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a bone to pick with the people of Tower of Babel. <laughs> What's your bone? Well, wasn't for them, we'd all be speaking the same language. Oh, yeah. Think of how much easier life would be. Life would have been easier. and uh, But, yeah, they, they kind of were full of themselves, but now these guys are full of the Holy Spirit. And um, and I think they were anointed. You know, this is an anointing by God. Um, not only to, you know, be able to speak and have people of all languages understand them, but from this event, I mean, the the church was born and it exploded. I mean, right. it was like it went viral, right? And like that's why I'm always amazed because what is it? Three thousand? It says three thousand men came to be baptized. Because mm -hmm. I don't think it says women or children. It's just that three thousand men came to be baptized, right? So could have there been more? Absolutely. But it's just one of those like, imagine what that would have been like to see like, 
I almost think about the whole idea of like, well, how long would 3,000 baptisms take? Mm-hmm. And then I think about, well, the youth gathering, we commune 25,000 in a short time. Mm-hmm. Or I was thinking, you know, based on a previous podcast we've done, and I saw something kind of an update on that, the Jesus Revolution movie, like how many people were being baptized at Pirate's Cove. Yeah, right. And how, I guess, is it this weekend they're planning to do another baptism thing there? I think I saw on Twitter from Greg oh, really? Rory that they're okay. planning to do, like a, a baptism there at the... Very cool. Pirate's Cove. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many people come. I bet they have a lot of folks there. Um, so, yeah. And uh, so so they can hear and understand one another in their own languages. And everybody, as you would imagine, is amazed and astonished. And um, And someone says, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Like, and how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? So there's the miracle. You know, God is is uh, taking people of different languages and allowing them to hear and understand one another. Oh, what a wonderful thing. I mean, you, you know, you and I can relate to that. Like when we've gone to Cambodia, how we needed a translator to oh, yeah. communicate with people. And I'll never forget the first time that I got to do a chapel in front of the people on day one, and um, Pastor Samuel was next to me, and you know I'm supposed to preach the word, and so I'm I'd say a phrase, and then I'd have to wait for him to say it, and he would say it in Khmer, and then I would say it in English, and he would say it in Khmer, and then I would do some kind of movement with my body, and he would emulate it, and um, so it, it was kind of fun. We had a little fun with that. Yeah, and like, and that was just a different experience for preaching because it was, you know, I'm not used to like preaching sentence by sentence. Yeah. And it was, and you know, so that's one of those things. If you haven't memorized, it throws you off because you kind of get that rhythm, yep. and yep. you can't duplicate that, gain that rhythm down practice unless you're practicing with your translator. Yeah, I remember why I had an example. I said, you know, it's like well, we're walking in the dark in our bedroom, and we, in our bare feet, and we run into something like maybe our dresser, which that shows me I'm a dumb American in Cambodia. There's no dressers in these people's huts, you sure. know. So I, I, I began to act like I was hopping around with a, a sore toe. And then I look over and there's Pastor Samuel hopping around like me and making the same noises. And then I fell to the ground. I started rolling around. And I look over. He fell to the ground, started rolling around. And all the kids were just dying of laughter. And they probably are like, who is this tall, white, goofy right. guy? Right, you know, you're probably a giant amongst. Yeah, men. I was pretty tall, uh, but with them. But I just thought that was such a cool thing to experience. You know, we're speaking, you know, in our own languages, and uh, everybody gets because I said, yeah, I think of when, you know, we we're because I think we did three services the first day, and we we're talking about Jesus and the crucifixion, and like, you know, the first time I did, I kind of put on my arms like Jesus on the cross, and Pastor Samuel did that. Mm-hmm. But then the next time when I did it. He grabbed my wrist and then started to pretend to nail the nails into my hands. Wow. Which was like, I wasn't anticipating that because he didn't do it the first time. And then after that, like, okay, I'm like, this is what we're doing. And I kind of pretended to wince each time when you bang like his hand into my hand, like saying to find the nail into the hand. That's cool. That must have been pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was, and I hope the people there thought so as well. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's like visual visual things like that. It doesn't matter what language you're speaking. You 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 understand it just by you know what what you're seeing. And right. um, so here, um, you know, in verse nine, it gets into all of the places of where the people were were from. And uh, I just kind of pulled up a map. If uh, you know, if you just kind of Google map of towns of Pentecost, you'll see. It's almost like uh, like Jerusalem's in the center, right? And all of these named areas, um, most of them are kind of north and some to the west. Uh, three are kind of like south, like Egypt, Judea, Arabia. And out east is Elam for the Elamites. And, you know, the Medes were out like northeast of New Jerusalem. And it's it's really kind of a cool display of like, you know, how now from this place, the word of God and the faith in Jesus will fan out in that area of the world. And I don't know, maybe I'm looking too much in this picture that you got pulled up. 
To me, it almost looks like a Ferris wheel. Yeah. And you think about how that just spins around, and that's kind of what the disciples, they all spread out and mm-hmm. went around that circle as the Ferris wheel moves. Yeah, it's basically, you know, kind of straight up from Jerusalem, a little bit to the north, a little bit to the south, and around the Mediterranean Sea, right? And right. And so, yeah, it's like spokes on a wheel is really what it is. And that's um, the hub is Jerusalem. And, and that is where, you know, the Jesus act of salvation on this earth happened. And uh, so from there, we fan out uh, the faith. Right. And uh, so on this day, this day of Pentecost, um, we've all been affected by that, if you really right. think about it. And... You know, as I'm looking too at your picture that you got pulled up, it has where you see everybody going towards mm-hmm. the same area with mm-hmm. arrows. Yeah. But then you think about the sending at the Great Commission, kind of the ascension. Jesus is sending them out. So then you, you reverse those way those arrows are going. It's going, and, you know, I would say when you look at those picture, that picture you pulled mm-hmm. up, it looks like you'd, in a sense, hit the whole world yes. as you spread out and go those separate ways. Right, right. And so that's what I was saying. Like, here we are in the United States in the year 2023, and the reason we know Jesus is because of this day, because it began the migration outward. And, you know, I don't know how long it took to for the Word of God to get to America. I, I don't know. Um, right. But... Uh, but thanks be to God that there there were faithful people who like witnessed and spoke of these things. And and it was as Jesus said, going back to the ascension, you will have power from the most high God, from the Holy Spirit. And um and that's what this this took. It took power from the Holy Spirit to carry the word out and sink into people's heart to engender faith. Mm-hmm. And move that the spokes so that it does get spread out, and you know, and that shows the importance of it. That people thought it was so important that they continued to pass that news on to others that they didn't want it to end with them. Mm-hmm. So I kind of giggled at the reading, you know, in verse twelve, that everybody stood amazed and perplexed, and they asked the question, "What does this mean?" You know, like a good Lutheran, Lutheran. catechumen, um, like our confirmands. You know, right. they say the. The um, Apostles' Creed and the meeting. What does this mean? Or I think of, if I'm correct, the the homo, not homolax, the hermeneutics book that we had in seminary. Mm. Did you have What Does This Mean by no, Doctor Veltz? No, I did not. That was the exegetic, like our homiletics book that we used. Mm. Was What Does This Mean by Doctor? I don't remember that book. I don't think we had that one. Oh, you are missing out. We had uh, Walther's Law and Gospel. Oh, Vals. Men. Men. We had <laughs> good old Jimmy V, another Jimmy V, Jim, James Veltz. James Veltz. All right. So, yeah, we can be thankful for this particular Pentecost celebration 50 days after Jesus' resurrection where, you know, basically the church was born and 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 just blew out, you know, and so I know Antioch is the place where, you know, the first Christians, you know, were named. They used to be called people of the way. And uh, so, but it, it had to start here with the power of the Holy Spirit. So each person was anointed by God to go spread the good news, just as we are. We're, we're anointed to by God and his word and the spirit who dwells in us, who, like you say, tabernacles. Oh, that's a good word. In us. And uh, and so we we have his power to share. Right. And what I always laugh or think is really interesting is when you look at like verses 42 through 47, when it talks about what they devoted themselves to, mm. the teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that we still do those four things in the church today? The teachings, that's what we get out of the scripture readings mm-hmm. and the message. The fellowship. That's why we have the Hebrews Cafe and the coffee hour. Yeah, get, gathering together, sharing life. Breaking of bread, communion, mm-hmm. and then praying. So like all those four things have stood the, to- the to- testimony of time since the very beginning of what we consider the start of the church. Yeah, and that word devoted. This is what they devoted themselves to do. They were faithful 
to to living in this manner. What are we devoted to, you know, in our day and time? Cell phones. Yeah. Right. And uh, all sorts of other activities. But, boy, wouldn't our lives be more blessed? uh, That's probably a bad usage of grammar there. Wouldn't our lives be blessed in a greater way if we were so devoted, you know? Right, where we put that as our number one priority, Mm -hmm. which is the way it's meant to be. And I always think of that analogy because people are like, oh, well, I just don't have the time. And I know I've done this with children's messages where you take like a, a bowl or something and you start filling it in with like flour. Be like, okay, go to work, brush my teeth, eat lunch, mm-hmm. all the stuff you got to do. And then the ball represents like time with God. You can't fit that in there and shut the lid. But when you put the ball in first... And then you pour all those things around there. It fits. Everything fits. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Yeah. And such a good visual for us to, you know, if you got your priorities straight, God first, time with him, you're devoted to him, everything follows and it fits, you know. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you, you know. And it's true. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. Maybe this was a shorter one, but uh, it was great again to be with everybody, and we hope you had a blessed Pentecost, and uh, remember that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.